Section number 57 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Chapter 13, Spheres of Action, Philosophism. In the earlier period, Spanish orthodoxy seems to have been little troubled with free thinking, nor, when this was encountered, does it seem to have been visited with the same vindictiveness as Protestantism. From a temporal point of view, it was less dangerous and the denial of god was an offence less than the denial of papal supremacy in an auto at toledo november eighth sixteen fifty four there appeared don francisco de vega venero characterized as herge apostata atesia who escaped with reconciliation confiscation ten years of prison and three years of exile from Toledo, Madrid, and Renato. The intellectual movement of the 18th century in France, however, could not but awake an echo in Spain, despite the severity of censorship and the quarantine at the ports. There was a steady infiltration of liberalism, political and spiritual. Spaniards of culture who traveled or were sent abroad on missions returned with enlarged horizons of thought and could not but compare the backwardness of their native land with the activity for good or for evil of the other european nations the more the writings of the fashionable philosophers of france were denounced the greater became the curiosity to examine them a reactionary writer tells us the words of filigannerary roselle mably Condillac, Piera, Fibronus, Hontheum, and Sipcone de Ricci had full circulation in the universities and colleges. Some professors taught many of their principles. The students were infected, and this moral postulance extended rapidly without attracting due attention. The Abbey Clement found in 1768 that one of the obstacles to success of his Jansenizing mission was the secret tolerance and indifferentism. It was difficult to believe how great was the evidence of incredulity united with the externals of devotion, even under the oppression of habitual dread of the severity of the Inquisition. Thus, in the later half of the 18th century, the decadent activity of the Holy Office found a new hearsay to combat, which it styled philosophism or naturalism. The leading ministers of Carlos III, such as Aranda, Camponances, Rhoda, and Florida Blanca, were shrewdly suspected of sympathy with these dangerous speculations. But the time had passed when the Marquis de Villanueva could be arrested and prosecuted without the assent of the king. It was safer to make examples of men not thus protected, but yet sufficiently conspicuous to serve as warnings. Such a case was that of Dr. Louis Castellanos, health officer of the port of Cadiz, a freethinker calling himself a philosopher an agnostic who professed to know nothing of god and who probably was indiscreet in airing his opinions on his trial by the seville tribunal he at first denied but subsequently he confessed and begged for mercy on june thirtieth seventeen seventy six an auto with open doors was held in the chapel of the castle of triana which were present doubtless by invitation that could not be declined the duke of medina celli the count of torgion 
and innumerable other distinguished personages at which castellanos was sentenced to abjuration and confiscation to wear a san benito de dos aspas and to serve for ten years in the hospital of the presidio of oran a severity which emphasizes the dread inspired by this negation of opinion contemporary with this was a case of more far-reaching influence pablo olivadi a young lawyer of lima and judge in the audiencia distinguished himself in the terrible earthquake of seventeen forty six and was made custodian of the treasures dug from the ruins after satisfying those who could prove their claims he employed the remainder in building a church and a theater there were disappointed claimants who carried their complaints to madrid olavide was summoned thither disbarred condemned to pay various sums and imprisoned his health failing he was allowed to go to Leguins, where he contracted marriage with Isabel de los Rios, whose two successive husbands had left her large fortunes. He was remarkably intelligent, brilliant in society, and with the aid of his wife's money he speedily acquired prominent social position. He traveled, and in France he formed relations with Voltaire and Rousseau, with whom he maintained correspondence. Arnanda, who secretly sympathized with him in this, was then at the height of his power and became his warm friend, seeking to use his abilities in the projects on foot to elevate Spain from its condition of poverty and misery. Practical statesmen had long recognized as a serious evil the baldios, or extensive and numerous tracts of uncultivated land, useless for all purposes except as pasturage for the migratory flocks of the mesta that powerful combination of sheep owners who had secured legislation restricting all cultivation that interfered with their privileges as early as seventeen forty nine the marquis of la Esenada had entertained projects of introducing colonies of foreigners to occupy these idle lands in 1766 the idea was revived and nuvas poblaciones as they were called were established in various places a contract was made to bring six thousand german and swiss catholics and establish them on the southern slope of the sierra morana along the main road from Madrid to cadiz a wild and rugged country the haunt of highway robbers campanez drew up the plan under which establishments of the religious orders were absolutely prohibited the settlers were to have pastors of their own race all spiritual affairs were to be in the hands of the parish priests subject to episcopal jurisdiction and the dreaded mesta was not allowed to intrude olivade was appointed superintendent of the colony and was also made assistante or governor of seville he threw himself into the project with enthusiasm labored with intelligent activity overcame the initial difficulties and for some years success seemed assured gradually however trouble arose with the capuchin friars who had accompanied the colonists as their priests friar romad of freiburg the prefect of the group was a disturbing element involved in quarrels with the episcopal officials friction sprang up between him and olivade which developed into hatred and the inquisition furnished ready means for gratifying malvolence in september seventeen seventy five romald presented a formal denunciation of the superintendent as an atheist and materialist who was in correspondence with voltaire and rousseau who read prohibited books denied the miracles and held that non-catholics could be saved ample details were furnished of his irreligious walk and conversation some of which indicate the points on which quarrels had arisen 
not resorting to prayer and good works to avert calamities, forbidding the ringing of bells in tempests, wanting corpses buried in cemeteries rather than in churches, and defending the Copernican system condemned by the church. Olivade's protector, Aranda, had fallen from power in 1773, and the opportunity was not to be lost by the inquisition of striking at a man conspicuous enough to serve as a terrifying example, and yet who, as a kinless loon, had no influential family behind him. Besides, the whole scheme of the Poblaciones had aroused the hostility of two influential classes, the friars whose establishments were excluded, and the mesta, whose flocks were not allowed to ravage the fields. It showed the decadence of the Inquisition that the royal permission to prosecute was sought and obtained. Olivide was summoned to court towards the end of 1775 on a pretext after some delay he realized the situation and sought the protection of Manuel de Roda, then minister of Gracia e Gestica, who was too vulnerable himself to compromise his own safety, and who merely wrote to Inquisitor General Beltran a note speaking favorably of Olivide. The Madrid tribunal moved with deliberation for it was not until November 14, 1766, that Olivade was arrested. For two years he disappeared from human sight. Seventy-two witnesses were examined, and the fiscal accumulated a formidable array of a hundred and six heretical propositions. He emitted imprudent talk while denying all lapse from the faith, but he confessed enough for the inquisitors to assume that he secretly cherished the opinions of the fashionable philosophy, and his condemnation was inevitable. We are told that a public auto was desired in order to emphasize the warning, but it was felt that the occasion scarce justified such a solemnly, and the Roman Inquisition was consulted, which suggested that the purpose would be answered by a private auto with a large number of spectators. It was held November 24, 1778, in the audience chamber, after inviting invitations equivalent to commands, campanans and numerous prominent nobles, statesmen, and others who had been connected with Olivade, or were suspected of philosophism, so that when he was brought in he found himself surrounded by his friends assembled to witness his humiliation. For three hours he listened to the long-drawn recital of all the heretical propositions proved against him by the witnesses, to which he responded by ejaculating, I never have lost the faith, although the fiscal says so. Then followed the sentence pronouncing him a convicted heretic, a rotten member of the church, and condemning him to reconciliation, confiscation, and banishment for ever for forty leagues from Madrid and all royal residences, the kingdoms of Lima, Andalusia, and the colonies of the Sierra Morena, to reclusion for eight years in a convent, and to the customary disabilities for himself and his descendants to the fifth generation. This tremendous severity so overcame him that he fell senseless to the floor. A distant convent at Girona was selected for his confinement in 1780. On the plea of ill health, he was allowed to visit a watering place from which he escaped to France, not without, it is said, the secret convents of the court although when his extradition was demanded he sought safety in Geneva. With the outbreak of the revolution he returned to France, where he narrowly escaped the guillotine. Adversity brought a change of heart, and in 1798 he published anonymously at Valencia his El Evangelo en Trafino, o Historia de un Filosofo de Singandio which had an enormous circulation 
and so impressed Inquisitor General Lorenza that he was allowed to return to Spain. He was offered restoration to his positions, but he was disillusioned with the world. He retired to Beza, devoting himself to good works and dying in 1804. The Inquisition had not miscalculated the salutary influence of the example. Don Philippe Samitego, Archdeacon of Pamplona, Knight of San Diego and member of the Royal Council, was one of those constrained to be present and was so frightened that the next day he denounced himself to the tribunal as a reader of prohibited books, of which he presented a long list. This, he said, had led him to religious doubt, but on a serious reflection he had resolved to adhere firmly to the Catholic faith, and he asked to be absolved ad cautelum. He was turned to account by being required to submit a sworn statement as to where and how he had procured the books, how long he had held these views, who had taught him, with whom he had discussed these matters, and who had refuted or accepted his opinions. This brought out a detailed confession compromising almost all the learned and enlightened men of the court, Aranda, Flora Blanca, Campanmos, O'Reilly, Lacey, the Duke of Almodovar, and many others of high position. Prosecutions were instituted against them all, but the testimony of a single witness was insufficient, and the power of those implicated was so great that the tribunal was content to let the cases remain in suspense. Offenders less conspicuous were less fortunate, and numerous cases attested the resolve of the Inquisition to crush out the new ideas. It was merciful to Benito Bales, a professor of mathematics and author of a series of textbooks long in use, for a niece was allowed to enter with him the secret prison and take care of him as he was aged and crippled in all his limbs. Before the publication of evidence, he confessed to having entertained doubts as to the existence of God and to immortality, but that solitude and reflection had removed them, and that he was ready to abjure and accept penance. As reclusion in a convent would have deprived him of the care of his niece, his house was charitably assigned to him as a prison with various spiritual penances. A more suggestive case was that of Dr. Girago de Vicente, professor of philosophy in the University of Valladolid, for certain these in which were discovered twenty propositions savoring of naturalism, and for a sermon in which he argued that true religion consisted in the practice of virtue and not in external observance. For eight years he lay in the secret prison, but it chanced that he had an uncle who was an inquisitor of Santiago, whose influence induced Valladolid tribunal at length, in 1801, to pronounce him insane while condemning his propositions. On his release, however, he gave such evidence of sanity that the tribunal felt obliged to arrest him again and repeat his trial. This time a year of incarceration sufficed. He abjured his errors publicly and accepted certain penances. A case which excited much attention was that of D. Ramon de Salas, a prominent man of letters and professor in Salamansa, imprisoned in 1796 on the charge of entertaining the heirs of Voltaire, Rousseau, and other exponents of the new philosophy. He admitted that he had read their works, but only for the purpose of confuting them, which he had done publicly and in writing. The accounts which have reached us of his trial differ irreconcilably, but it appears that the prosecution was the result of private enmity on the part of men high in office, and that Salas had powerful protectors who induced Carlos the Fourth to invoke the case after he had been condemned. This invasion of inequality
inquisitorial jurisdiction led to resistance on the part of inquisitor general lorenzana which caused queen maria luisa to exclaim to him it is you hypocrite and the like of you who caused the revolutions of europe not only was the sentence annulled and salas was liberated but a royal order was obtained that in future no arrest should be made without previously consulting the king this was duly drawn up but vallejo archbishop of santiago and president of the council of castile one of the enemies of salas had sufficient influence with godoy to procure its withdrawal this case illustrates the struggle on foot between the forces of conservatism and progress in which the inquisition as the protagonist of the former was not always successful the propagators of the new ideas were difficult to silence even under carlos the third we are told that in seventeen eighty five to seventeen eighty six there appeared in saragossa essays scandalizing to the faithful for they sought to establish that celibacy is prejudicial to the state that vows of religion should be postponed to the age of twenty-four that the church has customs detrimental to the state and that its abuses and superstitions should be suppressed apparently the inquisition took no steps to vindicate the faith and when fay diego de cadiz at the request of many ecclesiastics preached against these subversive propositions he was obliged to fly and even then he was pursued by the wrath of the innovators under the anomalous government of carlo the fourth constant changes in the ministry and the fluctuating whims of his favorite godoy who liked to pose as the patron of letters and enlightenment in turns repressed the inquisition and gave it free rein a prominent personage of the time was the count francisco cabarrus a french adventurer who founded the bank of st carlos and alternated like other statesmen of the period between guiding the destinies of the nation and a dungeon after his imprisonment in the castle of batteries he relieved his mind in 1792 and 1793 of the thoughts which had accumulated there in three letters to jovellanos developing in verbose rhetoric the ideas of rousseau and the contract social education he argued should be universal but it should be purely secular and the clergy should not be allowed to meddle with it religious training being left to parents and parish priests in colleges the studies should be directed to fitting youth for actual life the existing universities were sewers of humanity whose scholastic theology and teaching of just a prudence were equally destructive to the human race the numbers of the clergy were enormously excessive constituting a running sore and a body subversive of all the principles of morals and statesmanship there should be stimulated a holy and virtuous indignation against all the absurd and apocritical devotions which pervert reason destroy virtue and cause heathendom to ridicule christianity for much less than this many a man like olivade had suffered bitterly but in seventeen ninety five calabarus prefaced these letters with one address to godoy himself as mi amigo and secure in the protection of the all-powerful favorite he was beyond the reach of the inquisition showing how uncertain was its functions during the disastrous period when absolutism was in the hands of a frivolous courtier the feelings of the orthodox towards these innovators are comprehensively expressed by fray francisco alvarado the leading champion of conservatism against the cortes of eighteen ten 
These philosophers, he says, have come to disrupt our union, to disturb our peace, to embarrass our defense, to distract our attention, to corrupt our fidelity, to overturn our state, to seize our fortunes, to degrade our reason, to abolish our religion, to what shall I say? To make our free cities a hell where nothing but blasphemies are heard and where there is little lacking to replace order with sepulchral horror. Virulent as is this abjuration, it is but the natural expression of the passions excited by the struggle in progress which each side felt to be a combat to the death. A moderated philosophism, as we shall see, triumphed in the Cortes of 1810-13, to 13. and although there has followed nearly a century of vicissitudes, some of them sanguinary, it has at least established its right to existence. The Inquisition was not mistaken in recognizing it from the first as its most dangerous enemy the embodiment of the modern spirit destined for better or for worse finally to supplant medievalism end of section 57 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc